So let's, uh, let's get into the word of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. I'm seeing lots of friends in the audience, so good to see them. Some who've come near and far. 2 Kings chapter 2, starting with verse 23, the word of God says, From there Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered him. You guys know what the word jeer means? It means to make fun of. They made fun of him. They teased him. And they said, get out of here, baldy. Because Elisha was bald. They said, get out of here, baldy. Get out of here, baldy. He turned around and he looked at them. And called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went on to Mount Carmel as if nothing happened. And from there returned to Samaria. What a beautiful children's sermon we're going to have today. (laughs) Praise God. So happy. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word and to get to know you better. This is exactly what this is about, knowing you better. We look forward to what you reveal to us in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen Amen and amen. You see why I didn't want to preach this? So we're doing a series called Next, New, Now, and this is part of Elisha's story, and I wanted to skip over it. And I wanted to skip over this part of the story in the same way I wanted to skip over the chapter 1, where it talks about something that Elijah, Elisha's mentor, his teacher, uh, did. These are the very difficult passages in Scripture that make us go, ooh, that didn't really sound too nice. Now, boys and girls, let me just get this out of the way. It is always good to respect your parents and respect your elders, right? Right? To respect your teachers, absolutely. And to respect your pastors, right? Always a good thing. That's an easy lesson to take from this already. And it's usually what is used as a platform for teaching young people to not be disrespectful. It is never a good thing, boys and girls, to tease one another. To tease anyone, young or old, to tease your classmates, never to call them names, never to find something about them that you find unusual and you want to make fun of it. You guys understand that? We should never be bullies. We should never name call. None of that. That is never a good thing. So these boys, according to the scriptures in the NIV, these boys did some bad things by making fun of a prophet and by calling him names. But the Bible says that he turns around and he curses them in the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to know when I first started studying for this passage, I wanted to find something really good in it. First of all, I was like, you know, the two bears could have been nice, right? Maybe in the Hebrew, the word maul doesn't mean what we think it means. Maybe these two bears were like yogi and boo-boo. Right? (laughs) Hello, Mr. Ranger, sir. (laughs) I mean, Mr. Prophet, sir. Do you want me to get rid of these guys for you? For a picnic basket? Come on, (laughs) boo-boo. Right? And you you would think that maybe there's a nicer version to this. And Yogi and Boo Boo come out, and they're really just looking for a picnic basket, and the 42 young guys just have a misunderstanding. They start running for their lives. But I don't think this is Yogi Bear and Boo Boo. I don't think this is going on here. But then I thought about, let me understand if it's really boys, like children. Well, in the Hebrew, the word is used often in the Old Testament And it refers to, in many times, young adults. The same word to refer to Joseph in uh, in the book of Genesis. It's been used to identify young kings. So it really could be very well young adults or unmarried young men. So it doesn't necessarily have to refer to children. And that is most likely what's happening. 
So then I thought, okay, maybe it's 42 young guys that come out the woods and they're like, yo, Baldy. And Elisha's on his way to Bethel and he sees 42 young adults coming at him. What, 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 what would you think? That's a game. <laughs> and if you're Elisha, it's going down. Right? And that's probably why he called on for the bears to protect him because the 42, you know, young gang members from a rival religion are trying to take him out. Except for one passage, one verse, one verse that just messes everything up. It says that he turned around. Meaning that they had let him pass on his way to Bethel, but they kept calling him names and he got upset. So he turned around around, which means he passed them, turned around. And I want to say, Elisha, don't do it. Don't turn around. Don't, don't, nope. Let it go. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names or words will never. Everybody knows that scripture. <laughs> and this is exactly what Elisha should have done. He should have said, you know what? I'm just going to let this go. These are just young kids. They're just making fun of me. They're trying to discourage me, but I don't care. I love that I'm bald. God made me this way. I'm beautiful. All this kind of stuff, right? Nope, nope, nope. He turns around and he does something in the name of the Lord. The Bible says he curses them in the name of the Lord and these bears come out. Now, here, here's, here's the problem with this. It's clear that Elisha is angry. Most of us will say, but God doesn't want his prophets to be disrespected. But can I say something? In the Old Testament, many of his prophets were disrespected, right? Many of them were beaten. Many of them had to endure all kinds of level of torture. Many of them were disrespected. It takes me back to chapter 1. In chapter 1, in chapter 1, Elijah, remember the teacher of Elisha, has a similar situation where the king at the time, Ahaziah, he had fallen ill. He had hurt himself, injured himself, falling through the lattice roof in his, in his palace. And, and so he was injured and he wanted to know if he could be healed from this, he would, if, he was, if it was survivable. So he sends word to another deity. He wants to speak to prophets from another deity and ask, am I going to be well? And so God tells Elijah, uh, 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 no, 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 no. You're not going to disrespect me like that. Elijah, tell his servants on their way to the other temple, tell his servants that he's not going to recover because he was acting like there wasn't a God in Israel. So the servants then take the message back to the king and they said, we heard from somebody who said you're not going to recover. He said, what did this gentleman look like? Oh, well, he was he had a very, like, a uh, furry uh, uh, coat on, and, and he had a leather belt, and, oh, that's Elijah. Go get Elijah and bring him here right now. This king did not like hearing bad news. Do you guys like to hear bad news? No, he didn't like hearing bad news. So he says, you bring that prophet Elijah here, and I'm going to have a word with him. So one captain and 50 of his soldiers went to find Elijah, and they found him on a hill. And they asked him a question. Are you the man of God? And Elijah's response is, if I'm the man of God, may fire come down out of heaven and consume you. What do you guys think happened next? Fire came out of heaven. Ouch. So those guys were gone. Word got back to the king. Hey, uh, the crew that you sent out to get, yeah, they're, um, they're a little toasty right now. They have second-degree burns. So he sends out another 50 with another captain, and they say the same thing. Mr. Elijah, sir, you get down here right now from the hill. He, he said, if I'm a man of God, may fire come down out of heaven and consume you all. What do you guys think happened next? I'm, I'm sorry. I, listen, I know the kids are laughing, but it's, it's kind of, it's, this is a bad temper. This is what I call a bad temper. Why is Elijah being so extra? Just say, yes, I'm Elijah. What, what can I do for you? Can you imagine? Pastor Henderson, you're the pastor of this church. If I'm the pastor of this church, may. Yeah, 
Yeah, don't do it, huh? You don't want me to do that, right? (laughs) Elijah seemingly has special powers, right? This is when he took down all the prophets on Mount Carmel. Fire came down out of heaven, consumed the sacrifice on the altar. It seems that he has a special connection with fire. We know that he was taken up in a whirlwind with horses and chariots of fire. I mean, this guy is a fire starter. So, so he, specially, he has special powers here. And he says, if I'm the man of God, this is what should happen. He sends another 50. Now, watch what happens here, though. Watch what happens here. When those guys come... There's a different reaction. The third captain, this is in chapter 1, verses 13, 13 through 15. It says, the third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged, man of God, man of God, I know you're the man of God, please. Please have respect for my life and the lives of these 50 men, your servants. They're your servants, not the kings, your servants. He says, see, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all their men, but now have respect for my life. 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Now have respect for my life. Have respect for my life. In other words, it appears, according to this guy, this captain, that Elijah did not have respect for the other lives. So have respect for my life and have respect for the life of my, of my men, please. And listen to what happens here. What does the Bible say? The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be what? Afraid of him. So Elijah got up and went down with him to the king. Question, was Elijah afraid? Well, the angel told him not to be afraid. Let me ask you the question again. Was Elijah afraid? Elijah was afraid. He was afraid of the soldiers, and this is why he was calling down fire out of heaven. Did Elijah have anything to be afraid of? What we learned in our very our first sermon in the, in the series, the prequel to the series, is we know that Elijah had moments, bouts of great fear, where he was afraid for his life, and when he was afraid, he would do things that were not very godly. I'm going to suggest something to you that most of us would struggle with, but Elijah in this moment acted out of fear. And this is why the angel says, don't be afraid. Go with them to their king. Stop being afraid, Elijah, and go to the king. I'm going to suggest to you that Elisha in chapter 2 had similar issues. Remember when we talked in the very first sermon, Elisha was following after Elijah and the prophets from all the different towns kept coming out saying, you know that God's going to take your master from you today. He goes, I know, be quiet. You know he's going to take your master from you today. I know, be quiet. And when Elijah was finally taken, they say, hey, why don't, we, why don't you send out a search party? Let's see if we can find Elijah. He said, you're not going to find him. He's gone. They said, no, we should do it. Let's just make sure. You're not going to find him. He's gone. Come on, Elisha. Okay, just do it. Whatever. And then they come back. They didn't find Elisha. What does he say? I knew this was going to happen. I told you guys. I'm sorry, but Elisha, very similar to Elijah, feels just a little emo. Just a bit. A little bit unhinged, right? Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay, do it, but whatever. And when they do it, see, I told you. A little maturity, please, here, Elisha. Somebody calls you baldy and you lose your temper to the point where you curse them in the name of the Lord. Many of us, when we read these stories of these type of acts, we believe this is simple divine retribution. We believe this is righteous indignation and we sign off on it no matter how grisly it looks. We're okay with it. Well, pastor, you know, you need to understand here, God does not bless ugly. My mom always used to say that. God don't bless ugly. They, they had it coming. But how many times did Jesus do this in the New Testament? Anybody? When Peter and the rest of the disciples were commissioned by Jesus, let's read this real quick. This is what Jesus gives them. This is in, this is in chapter 9 of Luke. Chapter 9 of Luke. Verse 1 says, Jesus called the 12 together. He gave them What? Power and what? Authority to drive out 
all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. What was their mission? To proclaim what? The kingdom of God. And they were given power and what? Authority. Elijah and Elisha were also given power and authority. Have you guys ever been given authority and power and responsibility? Anybody? When you're given responsibility by your parents, it means they trust you to do something. They trust you to vacuum the entire house. What an honor and a privilege. They trust you to wash the dishes. What an honor and a privilege. They have trusted you to feed Sparkles, your kitty cat. What an honor. What a trusted duty, right? God trusted them with authority and with power. Can I just say something based on what I've read in Scripture? There have been many times that godly people have abused the power and authority that God has given them. And prophets are not above reproach. Remember Moses when he was a prophet of God's people and God told Moses, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock and water will come out. And, and Moses says, ha, ha, sit back, God, watch me do my thing. Moses went out with his staff, started chastising the people and said, you people. Anytime you start a sentence off like that, it's not going to go well. You people. Must we fetch you water? And he strikes the rock and no water comes out because God told him what? To speak to it. Now Moses had struck the rock many years ago and water had come out. So he's like, I'm going to do it the way we used to do it back in the day. Give me that old time religion, right? We talked about this last week. But God told him to speak to the rock and not to hit it. He does what the second time? Instead of correcting his action of anger, he hits the rock again. And what happens? Water comes out. I guess God ordained it, right? God is like, no, it's all good, Moses. You're fine. You're cool. Ah, you lost your temper. It's all good. No. God allowed water to come out because Moses was given power and authority. He allowed water to come out, but as soon as Moses came into his private quarters, he says, you're done, bro. Give me your staff. Wait, wait, wait. What, 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 what? Come on. No harm done. Come on, God. We're just, just having a little fun out there. He says, you're done. You're not going into the promised land. I love you, I forgive you, but you're done. There's been abuse of power all throughout Scripture. David abused his power. Solomon abused his power. And there are times that prophets in Scripture also abused their power. Let's, con let's continue on in chapter 9 of Luke. Chapter 9 of Luke. It says, as the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus resolutely, we're in verse 51, in that very next one, Chapter 9, verse 51 says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead, of, uh, on ahead who went into Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was where? What was he doing? Heading to Jerusalem. Yeah, you're going to that other church. No, we, no, you, you keep walking, Jesus. You're going to another church. Keep walking. You're going to another academy. Keep walking. You're going to somebody else's house. Keep walking. When the disciples, it says when this happened, when the disciples James and John saw this, they asked the Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to do what? Where did they get that idea from, family? Where do you think they get that, got that idea from? Elijah. Jesus, they're going to reject you, the Son of God, the Messiah, after all the miracles you performed, after talking to that Samaritan woman at the well and, and helping her village out. They're going to disrespect you. This is a special week here. You're on your way to Jerusalem. Big things are about to happen. And they're going to wait until after three years of solid ministry, selling out stadiums all throughout Galilee. They're going to disrespect you in your face. Ooh, just give us the word and fire. We'll come down. So watch this, watch this, watch this. What does Jesus say? All right, boys, go do your thing. I gave you power and authority. Go call the fire. Is that what he says? The Bible says that Jesus rebukes them. Question, if Jesus were there with Elisha and Elijah, do you think they would have called fire out of heaven? Why would they not have done that? Because that's not the way of Jesus. But pastor, they're a prophet and they're following God. Yeah, 
They follow God up to a point, and there's times they get it wrong. And we have to understand when we read Scripture, there are times that prophets get it wrong. We talked about a prophet last week, and her own writing says, I never claimed infallibility. I never claimed infallibility. Heaven and heaven, God and heaven alone are, are infallible. But for me, I never claimed it. There is no prophet that can claim infallibility. David got it wrong. Jeremiah got it wrong. Isaiah got it wrong. All of them at some point or another, apostles, they got it wrong. Sometimes their temper got the best of them. Sometimes the fear got the best of them. But it didn't mean they weren't followers of Christ. It just, mean, it just means they're human. And here's the problem. Many of us can't see this as being a mistake they made because we see them as good people. And good people can't make bad choices. This is why, family, I'm talking to the parents right now. This is why, family, this is so important. Your children, parents, see you as good people. And that is why when you misbehave, and you act out of turn, and you act grisly, and you have fire rain down. Oh, pastor, you're being dramatic. There's no fire in our house. Uh, the book of James says that our tongue can spark a wildfire. You don't believe me? <laughs> you want to hear from James? Let's go to the book of James. So glad I brought my word. James chapter 3. James chapter 3, starting with verse 5. James chapter 3, starting with verse 5. The Word of God says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest, that what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a what? Fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And just so you know, the Greek word there, genesios, that word, when it says sets the whole life on fire, it shouldn't be trans translated as life. It should be translated as, as genealogy. It should be translated as lineage. When it sets the whole life on fire, really what James is saying, it sets the entire family your children and your children's children, meaning that what we do to our children impacts generations even after them. It sets them all on fire. He says it sets the whole course of one's life on fire and itself is set on fire by hell. The, the word there is, is Gehenna, which is taken from the Old Testament, the Valley of Hinnom. You know what happened in the Valley of Hinnom in the Old Testament? Parents sacrifice children to the God of fire and war. Sacrifice children. In fact, God says, you did things that had never even entered my mind. I can't believe what you have done. And let me tell you something. This is really important here because as prophets, watch this family, as prophets, Mom and dad, as prophets, ones who speak on behalf of God, you are charged with sharing the love of God with your children, speaking truth to your children. We cannot mingle it with our hatred. We cannot mingle it with our cynicism. We cannot mingle it with our dysfunction. We are called to speak on behalf of God, and our children are waiting. They're learning from us what is good. And when they see fire come out of heaven by your behest, when they see bears come out of the forest because you have cursed, you have justified things to them. Oh, okay, so it's okay to be good some of the times, and then sometimes it's okay to lose your temper. Thanks, Mom and Dad. I know you wanted this sermon to be about your children telling them what to do. I know, I know, I know. It's about you. It's about us parents who can be grisly. It's about us parents who can call fire down from heaven. And even though you're a good parent, oh, mommy, I would never say you're not. Papa, I would never say you're not. But good people can do bad things. And in this story, it's not justified. 
We'll see later on in Elisha's life that he actually corrects himself. We will see later on as we go on in this series, Elisha will have a pivotal moment in his experience where he can act exactly like he did in this moment. His first 24 hours as a prophet, he has an opportunity to act in the exact same way and he does something so totally different. And I can't wait till we get to that sermon. It's going to be so good. And kids, you can come back for that one. It's not as scary. Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew, it would be better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and thrown into the water than to lead one of these little ones astray. Parents, we are charged to be like Christ in our homes, and I get it. It is tough to be a parent, especially when you have your own emotions. You're like Elisha and Elijah. You go up and down. I get it. Sometimes there's different cycles in the month that kind of manipulate the way that we experience stuff. I get it. Your body was upset with you, came down hard on you. So coming home, it's hard for you to bear this burden. You don't want to bear the burden. You want to unleash. But there are times, parents, we just get it wrong. God is calling us to be better. God is calling us to allow our light to shine. The fire is not to set the house on fire. The light that God has given you is so that you can show your children the love of God. I love my mom. She passed away three years ago, and she was the best mother, the best, absolute best mother. But I'll never forget something that she did, and I know she did it because this is how she was raised, and she was passing on what she had learned. But I'll never forget this. My my two brothers got in trouble for something, and and she told them, go into my room and wait for me. You're going to get it. And we all knew what that meant. The only thing we didn't know is what would be the instrument. That's all we did. That's the only mystery. I know children, you guys have it. A lot of you guys are in good situations. Growing up, it's... But we didn't know any better. Can, can we be honest? We didn't know. Th- there was no outlet. There was no person we could call. We couldn't call a relative and say, hey, uh, stuff's about to go down in my house. Help! <laughs> right? You call an aunt uncle, they'd be like, what'd you do? Back in the day, there could be a member at the church that could do it, and your parents are like, yeah, they got you, and wait until I tag in at home. Got some sick people in church. Hurting us little children. We ran, we we disobeyed, we made a mistake. It doesn't mean the bears should come out. So my mom, she did her business. I heard my brothers, they were crying, and I was like, oh man, the Lord don't bless ugly. Then my mom came out. I'll never forget this. She was like out of breath, right? And my mom is just sweet, sweet, sweet. So when she had these moments, it was always kind of weird, but we knew mama didn't play. So she came out and she says, Jonathan, come here. Wait, (laughs) I'm going to come closer, but mom, the tone. (laughs) Did I do something wrong? She says, go in the room. Wait, 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 why, why, why do I have to go in the room? You know what my mom said? You did something last week that deserved this, but I let it go. That's called grace, mom. That's good. (laughs) Wait, wait, what? But my mom had worked herself up into a lather. And parents start saying stuff like this. This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. No, it's not. (laughs) You're not crying. I'm the one crying. Don't give me. And if you you think it's going to hurt you more than it's hurt me, then let's not do it at all. No one's hurt. Can we try that? Nobody's hurt. Listen, I understand. This is not about, this is not about shaming parents. Understand this. I'm a parent as well. My first foray into parenting was a 16-year-old girl in the foster care system who had been there all of her life. Before Nathan was born, my first experience being a parent, let me say this again, with a 16-year-old girl who had been in foster care and did not know what the future held for her. She brought it. And she wanted to test the limits of love. She wanted to act out so much that we would reject her because that's what she believed she deserved. 
And she used to be in a home that was a Christian home, but there were things that happened, according to her, that were not Christ-like. It was grisly. And I had to figure out on the fly how to hold boundaries, how to even discipline, at the same time not be fearful and drive my children in fear. You may say, but pastor, they need to learn respect like those 42 boys. They need to learn respect. I agree with you. They did need to learn respect. But you don't respect someone you fear. Do I need to say that again? You don't respect someone you fear. You're just afraid of them and you do what they say because you don't want to get hurt. The principle of discipline is all throughout the scripture, and we should. We should be able to discipline our children. However, how we discipline them is also a principle. And we have to do better. I learned very early on, I was like, I don't want my son to see me the way that I saw my mom and dad at times. And so it simply came down to this. Do you want me to delete that, that app on your, on, your, on your iPad? I will delete it. Nathan, I will delete it right now. I'm deleting it. It is gone. It is. No, Daddy. Delete. Now go to bed. Ah! He didn't know that I could reinstall it, right? He didn't need to know. He was too young. But boy, that delete function, woo! I got some mileage out of that. I will. Do, you, you, you see? I'm about to do it. You better do what I say. Right? I found ways that I could still create an environment of of discipline, but I didn't drive the home in fear. Parents, I know it's tough, and I know that you're justified to be angry. I know that you have feelings, and I know some of you are in situations where you have special needs. I know you're in some situations where, you know, uh, uh, children may be on the spectrum and there's more challenges. I get it, but guess what? God trusted you with them. He trusted you with them. He said, I knew that I could trust little Jimmy with you. I knew that I could trust Lisa with you. I knew that I could trust you. What you are going to go through with your children, watch this family, what you're going to go through with your children is bearable. Not unbearable, it's bearable. What does the Bible say? I will not give you anything that is too much for you. Isn't that what scripture says? That God will never put more on us than we can bear ourselves. What God gives us, according to the book of James, what God gives us is bearable. So let's do better. Can we do that? Pastor, please clean it up. I don't like you making some of the prophets look like bad guys. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, we're closing on this. Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible says this. Hebrews chapter 1, starting with verse 1. We're closing on this. Listen to what the word, word of God says. In Hebrews chapter 1, starting with verse 1, it says, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he speaks to us through who? Through his son, who is what? Appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the what? Exact representation of his being. You hear what the the word of God says? In other words, even though he spoke through prophets at many times, they were never the exact representation. They were good, they just weren't exact. So when we look at these moments in scripture and we go, ooh, I can't imagine Jesus doing this, that's because Jesus would not do that. When we're trying to reconcile what's happening in the Old Testament with what we see in the New Testament with Jesus, Jesus is the benchmark. Jesus is the lesson. Jesus is the standard. Jesus is the principle. If Elijah and Elisha do not meet the principle and standard of Jesus, we do not follow them. We follow Jesus. And we're willing to say, maybe Moses didn't have it right. Maybe Elijah didn't have it right. Maybe Elisha didn't have it right. But if I want to know the truth, the truth and nothing but the truth, who do I look to? I look to Jesus. Even with your parents, they're going to get it wrong, boys and girls. You look to Jesus. He is the perfect example of our Heavenly Father. And he does not want you to be afraid. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, 16 through 18. Parents, I want you to go to this. I'm not going to have it on the screen. I actually want you to go to this on your phone. 
in your Bibles. I want you to go to this. This is you, parents. 1 John, we're closing on this verse. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, 16 through 18. This is what John says. I want you to go to it because I want you to know where it is because you're going to go to this. You're going to go to this when you are feeling grisly. You're going to go to this when you feel like calling fire down from heaven. You're going to go to this when you've lost your temper, when you're frustrated. You're going to go to this place, okay? Chapter 4, verse 16 says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. We rely on whose love? God's love. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In the world, we are like Jesus. There is, verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Elijah, stop being afraid. Just come down the hill. They're not going to lay a finger on you. You're a prophet. You're... It's so interesting. And after Elijah makes the mistake that he makes, that God takes him to heaven in the very next verse. <laughs> it's like Elijah just blows his top and God is like, okay, buddy, it's time to come home. Just like Moses. All right, come on, come on, come on home, come on home, come on home. A lot. Yes, I know, they scared you. Come on, come on, come on. But pastor, why would God allow something like that to happen if it didn't represent his character? God allows a lot of things to happen and it doesn't represent his character. Pilate says, don't you know I have the authority to crucify you? Christ says that authority and power was given from above. Are you going to abuse it? But that's supernatural power. Why would God allow supernatural power? God allows supernatural power and natural power for us to have authority and dominion. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to use your tongue for blessings? To edify? But my kids need to know they can. Tell them in love. Well, I don't know how to. Look to Jesus. How do you want him to treat you when you mess up? He's gentle. He whispers. Stop raising your voice. They can hear you. But my mom and my dad, I know, I know. And their parents did the same to them. They didn't know any better. But now you do. Parents, there's someone here today. There's a parent here today that wants to say something to their children. You simply want to say this. In no circumstance and no situation from this point on do I want to be grisly. I don't want to rain fire down. I want to raise you up in love. I want to do the best I possibly can do in showing you the character of God so that when you grow older, you will trust God because you've seen him. And you've experienced him in my love. If that's where you are today, parents, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. It's okay to admit to your children that you still need work. Is that you? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Children, you see your parents standing on Children's Day. You know what they're saying? They want to be better parents. They want to be more like Jesus. Look at this. Praise the Lord. Family, let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for calling us to this place of repentance. We want to do better. You've entrusted us with power and authority, some over natural things, some over just supernatural things, but you've entrusted us, and we do not want to misuse that power and that authority. You have trusted us with an incredible gift. Our children... And we have the opportunity right now to show them who you are in the way that we talk, in the way that we walk. And yes, we know we're human and we make mistakes, but we want to make mistakes in a way that we don't justify it. We just want to learn from them and get better. So Jesus, thank you for showing us this example. Maybe Elijah and Elisha heard you tell them something that we didn't see in Scripture. But what we do know is what is clear in Scripture. And Jesus, you didn't call fire out of heaven not even when they nailed you to a tree. So we're going to learn to deal with our feelings being hurt, parents. We're going to learn to deal with those feelings when we don't get what we want and what we believe we deserve. And in no way will we take them out on others. 
especially not our children. Thank you so much for this challenge. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, and amen. God bless you.